Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your great grace. We thank you that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. You are the God of the entire cosmos, but you, you have made yourself available to us individually. You have come near. We have seen you face to face. And this morning, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the celebration of Christmas. Remembering the God that came near. The God that was made like His creation. The incarnation of God Almighty in the earth to become one of us. What an amazing God you are. You are worthy of all honor and praise. Hallelujah. Mm. We thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, reveal to us today in a deeper way the love of God for us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Good good morning and Merry Christmas, right? Hallelujah. You've been saying that out there in the highways and the byways? It is. It's, it's funny how some people get taken back when you say Merry Christmas to them because they don't hear it. But then after, after you do, the smile comes on their face and they return the, comp, the uh, greeting to you and it's amazing. So, I love Christmas. You know, you know, even the church, the church gets into this whole deal on um, the uh, consumerism of Christmas and everything. You know, even the consumerism of it is buying things for other people. You know, you're thinking of other people. It's, it's, it's one of the few times where everybody pauses and hopefully stops thinking about themselves and starts thinking about, about others. I, 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 I think... It's a wonderful time of the year, and unfortunately, I remember the times when I was a kid where all the stores were decorated, the music was playing. It, it was just a, a, a joyous atmosphere. And uh, uh, we've, we, the church, again, has allowed, allowed this wonderful time of year to be muddied up by uh, a culture that ruins everything that they touch. <laughs> Amen. But we're in church this morning, so we can, we can celebrate this morning, and we, we can rejoice, and we can be filled with joy. You know, these last two years have been not the best. We've, we've, we have, haven't been able to live free as we would want to. You know, for some people, it's, they've went through it without having anything Happened. Their life hasn't changed much, but for a majority of Americans, a majority of people, um, it's been years, a couple of years of struggle. It's been a couple of years of heartache, right? We, we, we in our own church here has had heartache in this last year. But the good news is, the good news is, is that no matter how our year has been, we always get to end the year celebrating. We get to celebrate that Jesus, Jesus has come. Right? That Jesus has come and He is our new beginning. Right? You know, Christmas is so special. But as a believer, every day really should be a celebration that Jesus is here, of the celebration of Jesus in our lives. And this glimpse, this glimpse that we get of the love and peace that so many people seem to feel only at Christmas time is something that we get to experience the whole year through. The whole year through. You know, Christmas is more than just a holiday feeling. You understand that? And what people don't understand is, is the, the, the atmosphere and the feeling that people have at Christmas time has nothing to do with the holiday. It has to do with Christ, the spirit of Christmas, who is Christ being manifest in, in, the, in the earth. See, Christmas is a rock-solid belief in certainty that God loves you. 
And so many people have such a hard time realizing that God loves them. And it, it's interesting, it seems like we as, as believers, as a church, we need to be convinced that God loves us. The ones that should know. Our Father sent His Son to seek you. To save you. You know, years ago, and I've shared this with, with, with you guys before, but years ago, um, back when um, you went to the mall to do your, your, shop, your shopping, um, and I was uh, a young Christian, and, and uh, we were walking through the mall, and, and all the festivities going on, and, and uh, there was a young teenage girl that was walking down the mall. She had this sweatshirt on, and, and it was all Christ, you know, festive, Christmas. And uh, I started reading it. It says, I'm the reason for the season. I'm the reason for the season. And I thought to myself, who does she think she is? You know? I, 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 I got very offended about it. And as I walked, I was thinking about these things. And Holy Spirit, that still small voice, came in and just whispered, she is the reason for the season. And in a moment, and just, with just one simple, one, one simple sentence, God was able to completely renovate my thought about Christmas and what it, what it means. And even though she had that shirt on that says, I'm the reason for the season, I don't think she truly knew that she really was the reason for the season. You know, it's hard for us to Believe that, that we're the reason for the season. Say with me, I'm the reason for the season. That's pretty good. Now, if some of you guys were a little hesitant to say that. If, if I, I understand, but my goal by the end of this message is to remove all hesitation. This morning we're going to read about the birth of Christ from a gospel that's usually not read at Christmas time. It's usually read from Matthew, or it's usually read from Luke. But today we're going to read it from the gospel of John. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. John gives the birth of Christ from a heavenly perspective. From a heavenly perspective. Um, Matthew and, and Luke, they, they give it from an earthly, a natural perspective. But John is looking at it from heaven's perspective. He's proclaiming what, what God sees and what God is doing. Right? It, it, there's this cosmic view. John starts with a whole cosmic view, zoomed out of all creation. Right? But then, as we'll see, John zooms in. He zooms down to particular individuals. A particular family. God chose a particular mother. God chose a particular stepfather. God chose a particular place in a particular time. This cosmic, great, almighty God it's particular. And he goes on in verse 14. It says in verse 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
There you go. That's all you get. That's the nativity of John. But it says that God, who was the creator of everything, came and became one of us. He, in, he became incarnate into human form, and he was filled with grace, which is God's empowering power, and he was filled with truth. He is God. He is the perfect reflection of who God is. He is the true nature of God. If you've seen Emmanuel, you have seen God. And this word that became flesh, John uses a particular Greek word, and that Greek word is logos. And he starts out with this, co this cosmic text, you know, this context of, of the whole cosmos, the whole creation. And then he, he zooms out as far as you can zoom out, and he says, in the beginning, in the beginning. When was the beginning? I don't know. I wasn't there. But in the beginning, the Word was. In the beginning, the Word was. In this Greek word that John uses here to, for the word, word is logos. Or logos, or however you want to pronounce it. And it can refer to a thought or an expression of a topic or subject. In this case, John is saying that the word is a divine expression and communication of God. A living voice that embodies a concept or an idea of who God is. Jesus is the narrative of God. Jesus is the face of God. That's amazing to think. And when God appears, when God appears, He looks like Jesus. And, and when God speaks, it, it's, it looks like Jesus. And, and when God communicates of Himself, it looks like Jesus. Understand to the extent, to the extent that anyone has experienced any truth, any life, any light, experience the living God, what they are experiencing is Jesus. To the degree that anyone has any light, that light is the light of Jesus. To the degree that anyone has, has any life, that life is Jesus. Whether they know Him by name or not, it's Jesus. He is the only light of God. Jesus is the only light of God. And He is the only revelation of God. Jesus is the only revelation of God. He is the incarnate God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. In Hebrews, um, the Hebrew writer tells us in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says that God in these last days spoke by His Son, who not only owns everything, but has made everything. And Jesus, the Word, the face of God, is a manifestation, the light of His glory, and that Jesus, the Word, the expression of God, is, is the perfect imprint, the express image of His person. And Jesus upholds all things by the Word of His power. When He had by Himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, Jesus is the light of the world. This revelation that John is trying to convey, the Word is life. The Word is light. And He is the only divine expression of God. This is what we're celebrating. That God has made Himself known. That God has come near. That God is not the God of just the cosmos and all of creation and the universe, but He is the God of the individual. He is the God that, of the particular person. He is the God that gets intimate right in your face. 
John zooms out to proclaim that the Word of God is God, with a capital G. He's as God as God can be. He's not an afterthought. He isn't just part of God. He, he isn't some created being. He's not an archangel. He is God. Jesus is God. And Jesus came. God came. But then he zooms in. He zooms in. John zooms in, and he says that God, the God of the cosmos, he zooms in, and he becomes a particular individual. He becomes a person. He becomes a human. The creator becomes his creation. You cannot say this about any other God. Any other false religion that proclaims that they worship the true God. People think that people think that all religions are the same. That's nonsense. That just shows your complete ignorance. All other religions try to get you to climb the ladder to reach God. But Christianity is the God that humbled himself and he climbed the ladder not to ascend but to come down. And he became one of us so that we could literally know who he was. So that we could have intimate relationship with God Almighty. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing to think that this is our God. That Jesus Christ reveals the true nature of, of the creator of all things. The one that is outside of time and space. The one that is above all things. The mighty God. Jesus Christ is a perfect picture of who he is. Too often, too often we can get lost in the bigness of God. We get lost in the bigness of God and, and, there's, it, it, and it creates a distance between us and God. You know, there are some people that actually believe that Oh, they believe in a creator, but they don't believe that after the creator created everything that he has anything to do with his creation. There, there are all diff these, different, these different ideas about God. And the reason why they struggle and the reason why there's not that intimacy is because they do not know God revealed in Jesus Christ. And we can get lost in this, big, this bigness. We can get lost and feel distance and forgotten in His creation. There are so many people during this time of year that feel forgotten. They, they, they feel distance. They, 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 they feel lost. How can this almighty God see me? I mean, after all, He's, he's a busy guy. He's got galaxies to run. But John says that God zoomed down and became one of us. God became a particular man. And this zooming down reveals who God is. Do you understand this? Jesus reveals who God is. God is a God of intimacy. God wants to reveal Himself personally. God makes His dwelling with us. He tabernacles with us. That's amazing. See, Jesus reveals that God is not only the God of the cosmos, but, God, but He's the God of the individual. He is the God that is near. Jesus reveals a God that desires to dwell among us, to be with us, to be with you. Look what Jesus revealed about who God is. In Matthew 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After His mother was betrothed to Joseph, before He came together, he was found with a child of the Holy Spirit. God belonged to a family. God desired to be, belong to a family. He could have come in so many different ways. But He desired to be like us. He desired 
a particular mother. He desired a particular stepfather, brothers and sisters. God wanted to be a family. And he zoomed in and became personal. In Matthew 2, 15 and 16, So it was, when the angel had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. To us. Not everyone. To them. This reveals a God that desires individuals to know. And they came with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. God chose to reveal himself to the shepherds. He could have revealed, he could have brought that proclamation to the entire world. But, he, but he's, revealed, he's trying to get an idea and an understanding of who he is across to us. He's, he's trying to get us to understand that he is a God of a particular individual, that he's a God that wants to be in relationship with you and you alone. Then he revealed himself to Simeon, in which Simeon replied, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation as he held Jesus in his arms. My eye, Jesus was the salvation of the world as a baby. Which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Then he, then he, then he got personal and intimate with Anna. And then the disciples and so it, and it just goes on and on. The Word that became flesh declares a God, a God that is a personal God. A personal God. That He desires to be intimate with humanity. Look, at, look what the Word that became flesh shows us in these encounters, okay? In Luke chapter 8, verse 40, it says, So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed Him. There's a multitude! There's a multitude, for they, they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. He was a big wig. He was important. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying because, but as he went, the multitudes thronged him, speaking of Jesus. Now, the woman, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said to her, or Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes are... are uh, uh, Multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I proceed power going from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason that she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This is not just in an encounter with a preacher. This is not an encounter with a prophet. This isn't an encounter with some religious guru. This is detailing an encounter with God. God. God is being thronged by the multitudes. And one, one elderly woman 
comes up and touches him, and he stops everything that he's doing for her. Do you see? You're seeing the face of God. The God of the cosmos, the God of all creation, the God that holds all things together. He stops, and he gives us understanding of what he is truly like. You know, Scripture tells us that Jesus healed the multitudes. How do you think he healed the multitudes? He's God. He could have said, poof, you're all healed. But he didn't do that. He met with each individual person. He took time with each individual person and healed them all. He seen, he looked into each one's eyes. He heard each one's story. He held and touched each one. This isn't, this isn't just a story about a man named Jesus. These are encounters with God. He's the God that goes to weddings. He's the God that goes to dinner parties. He's the God that takes time to talk to a, a woman at the well. He's a God, he's a God that is willing to cross a stormy sea, so he can find one person that is being tormented by devils and bring freedom and peace to that individual. This is what God looks like. He's a God that has friends. Jesus called his disciples friends. God, God wants friends. Are you a friend of God? Do you know this God? Do you know this God? See, this is the divine revelation of the expression of God made available to us all through the Word that dwelt among us all. He is the God that not only loves the entire human race, but He is the God that loves the person right in front of Him. And whatever the need is, Jesus showed that, that Jesus used His authority in the kingdom to address that need. This is our God. Jesus revealed something profound about God's love. That God's love is always particular. It's particular. See, we throw the word love around in our, in our, in our English language, in our culture. You know, we use it in many different ways. I lo love my wife, you know. Then we turn around and say, I love my dog. Well, we, say, we, we, we say, I love all of humanity. And then, I love a medium rare ribeye. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, is that when we're talking about the deepest kind of love, the agape love, the kind of love that God loves us with, it's always particular. See, when I say that I love my wife, when I tell my wife I love you, it's not because she's part of the human race. I don't love my wife because she's part of the human race. I don't love my wife just because she's female. There's lots of females in this world that I don't love the way that I love my wife. I love her particularly, individually. 
I, I have zoomed into her. Particularly and separated her apart from all others. My love for her is one of a kind. It is tailor made for her. It will, nor can it be, ever duplicated. And that's just a glimpse. That's just a glimpse of God's love for you. He loves us in particular ways. His love for you is not, it, 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 his love for you is separate. And it's individual from the love that he has for anyone else. It's not a general love, but it's a particular love. Now, this doesn't mean that God likes everything about you or about me. There are things in our life that are damaging, that are hurting us, and that's what we call sin. But in spite of those things that are damaging, in spite of those things that are hurting us, in spite of those things that are sinful, God still loves you. Look at how the psalm, psalmist speaks of this. In Psalms 139, verse 13, it says, speaking of God, you made all my delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in in." in Formed in utter, and I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand, and when I wake up, you are still with me. This is not given to us so that we might know how much God cared about the psalmist. This is given to us so that you can know that God cares about you, that He's intimate with you, that He, he had a role to play in the creation of you. He had a plan and a destiny and a purpose just for you. God loves you individually, not just because you're part of the human race. This is a God. This is the God, God that was made so clear to John. This is the God, the Word, that became flesh. You know, John, when he first became a disciple, him and his brother James, they were known as the sons of thunder. They were a rowdy bunch. But as he ex John experienced, he experienced Jesus. And after the death and resurrection of Jesus, do you know what John is referred to today? The apostle of love. The apostle of love. Not, not, o not only is love the focus of John's epistles, he is even referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I used to think that, you know, John must have been the favorite. John, you know, Jesus must have loved John more than all of them. Until I found out, till I figured out that it only says that John is the disciple whom Jesus loved in John's gospel. John's the one that wrote that about himself. John never refers to himself once in his own gospel by his name. It's always the disciple whom Jesus loved. See, that's the same today. We can get this religious idea that there's certain people that God loves more than me. 
that God loves more than you. We can get this idea because there's certain people, it just seems like they have a connection with God. It just seems like there's a closeness and a nearness with God. And we can get this idea that God has chosen them and favored them above us. But could it be that if they have just found the secret that John found out? They found out how much God loved them individually. And because they understand how much God loves them individually, it brought a closeness and a nearness that you're not currently experiencing. And it's still it's, it's the same closeness, the same near, nearness, the same love is available to us all. Because God loves us each individually, independent from the human race as a whole. And talk amongst yourselves. <coughs> John wasn't excluding anyone when he, was, when he wrote this, but he was reporting of the love that he had received from Jesus. John did not feel love because he was one of the disciples. He didn't lo feel love just because he was part of the crowd or part of the group. He experienced God's love in a way that was individual and particular to him. He is loved in his uniqueness. He has a one-of-a-kind love from the Father. John speaks as if he was the only one that Jesus loved. And we joke about this here. That God has my picture in his wallet. That God loves everybody, but I'm his favorite. That my picture is on his desk, it's on the mantle, he looks at it every day. But I want to go from just catchy little things to actually experiencing that love and knowing that love like John did. You know, when my kids were little, I have four kids and they were little, I'd call them over and give them a hug and I'd whisper in their ear, I love you. Your daddy's favorite. And they loved that. But what they didn't realize is that I did it to all of them. There's something about that. Once they got started getting older, they realized what I, what I was doing. But, but there is something about knowing that you are, a, that their, your father sees you as an individual, he loves you as an individual, and that you're his favorite. There's no one else like you. See, so understand the reason that the Holy Spirit had John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved rather than by his own name is because the Holy Spirit is inviting us all to insert ourselves into that same position. That we all can have a relationship with God that is not general. Or because we're part of humanity. Or we're part of the church. But it's intimate and particular. An individual relationship with God. Jesus revealed that God wants to have a relationship with you, a relationship that is totally unique to you, a, rela a relationship that's one of a kind. See, there's a lot of focus in the church about community, and it's important. You know, coming together as a body and worshiping together and, and serving one another and loving one another and praying for one another and encouraging one another and, and being part of the universal church and the corporate bride of Christ the body of Christ, we're called. And there is this corporate unity of the faith. But we must not forget that although we are the body of Christ, the Bible says that we are members in particular. God sees you separate from the body as a whole. He sees you as an individual, as a member within 
the body. Unique. Completely unique to yourself. What makes the body better is when the members have their own relationship with Jesus. Where we live in His love and feel like we're the only ones that receive His love. That we are special and unique. That all of His love is directed towards us. Because it is. Think about this. God is unlimited. God is infinity. What happens when you divide infinity with infinity? Nothing. You can't divide infinity because it's infinity. You can't take away from infinity. So God's love, listen, understand this. You need to understand this because this is, you, you have a carnal concept of love. You have an individual that has an infinity amount of love. And God's love is not diminished by the amount of people he loves. So no matter how many individuals there are, all of God's love can be on one individual in particular without diminishing his love for others. You are loved for your uniqueness to God. God did this all for you. Christmas is not just about God's love for the world, but it's about God's love for you. Christmas is for you. You in particular. You are not the recipient of just part of God's love. No, you are the recipient of all of God's love. All of God's love. It's all directed towards you. It's the same true of his attention. God is infinity in his attention. All his attention is directed towards you. All of his provision is directed towards you. All his compassion, his wisdom, it's all focused on you individually. Do you know that everyone knows that God made us with fingerprints? And there is no one that has the exact same fingerprints. But what most people don't know is that each one of us has a vocal print. That every one of our voices are individual to us. So what does this give us a glimpse of God? God reveals himself in creation, right? That means that God can see everything we're involved in because our hands have been touching it. God knows what you've been up to. And God can hear you individually from everyone else. God can hear your voice. He can hear your prayer. He can hear your cry. He can be totally focused on you and you alone when you talk to Him. Because there's no one else like you. And in, in, he, and it's an infinity being, He can direct all His focus just on you without diminishing His focus on anyone else. What an awesome God. What a loving God. You are the object of God's affection. You will never be more loved than you are right now. Believe it. Embrace it. Experience it. Christmas is all about you. It is true that Jesus came to live, to die, and to live again for all humanity, but it's also true that He did all that just for you. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 18, this is the face of God. He is revealing something to us. And in Matthew 18, verse 12, what is he revealing? He says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep 
and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one that is strain? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over the sheep, that sheep, than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of his little ones should perish. Do you understand what Jesus is revealing here? That if you were the only one, oh, no, it's not up here. If you were the only one, if you were the only one that went astray, if all humanity were perfect, and you're the only screw up. Jesus would have came just for you. Jesus would have died just for you. Jesus would have raised again just for you. This is the face of God. This is the true nature of God. He did it all just for you. God wants to love you, and he wants to redeem just you. This tells us that Jesus would have came, and he would have done it all. He would have laid down his life just for for you. Christmas is all about you. God did it all for you. This is the love that our souls are yearning for. This is the love that this world is looking for. This is the, the contentment and the purpose and the meaning that our young people are, are dying for. And how can we take it to them if we're not experiencing it for ourselves? If we question God's love for us, for our, when we're supposed to be the ones that are sharing his love with others. This is a love that this cold, dark, and dying world needs. It's the light. It's the life. That can transform our culture and our world. He wants us to experience eternal life. God desires for us to experience eternal life. Ask yourself, don't say it out loud because I don't want you to be wrong. What is eternal life? What is eternal life? You say that you have eternal life. What is eternal life? The good news is that God doesn't leave us to our own definition. God doesn't leave us to wonder. But Jesus, the face of God, tells us exactly what eternal life is. In John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus speaking says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is you, individually, knowing God. And so, you don't get screwed up in this God that you think you know, he says, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. If your God doesn't look like Jesus, you're, you, you don't know God. You're worshiping a false God. Do you understand that? The only way that you can truly know God is to truly know Jesus. For He is the face of God. He is the incarnate God. He is the Word that became flesh. He is the image bearer. He is the creator of all things. He is the sustainer of all things. He is God Almighty. And there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians, but the God that they serve does not look like Jesus. Eternal life is that you in particular may know an individual God who is Jesus. The God who has the face of Jesus. The God that speaks like Jesus. The God that loves you 
as if you were the only one. The one, the God that stops in the midst of the crowd. The God that, as he's dying on a cross, talks to the individual to his right, saying, today you will be with me in paradise. That is the God. That is our God. See, we are joined to God. We are joined to God. It's interesting. We had a conversation a couple weeks ago over coffee, and the brother says, and I thought it was a very good question because I never really thought about it before. He says, why doesn't God just show up and reveal himself to everyone? Just reveal himself. And I thought about that, and, and first the thing is, is, is we know that He has. He has in, in Jesus. Right? He has in Jesus. And, but I understand what He's saying. He's saying if, if, if God just showed up on His throne, seated in the heavens, and everyone's seen Him. And I, and I started thinking about this. It's, why does God choose to seem to hold himself back and 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 I and then I realized that God has shown himself he showed himself through Jesus but then Jesus went on and he said something to the disciples that our carnal mind can't understand and they and they they can't understand it either see he said that I am going to the father and for your sakes, it's better that I go that I might send the, the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. And that individual conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well, they, they, talked, they, they talked about, debated about where is the best place to worship God. Is it in, in the Samaritan's Mountain in their understanding? Or is it Mount Zion where, where, uh, in, in Jerusalem? And Jesus told her, well, the Jews do have that right there. They're worshiping in the right spot, but guess what? That's not what God wanted at all. God didn't want that. Yes, for that time, it was good. He could dwell among His people, but everyone had to go to that particular place. What happens if you couldn't get to that particular place? You can't meet with God. What, ha- what, ha- what happens if you didn't have the finances to get to that place? You couldn't meet with God. What happens if the masses were there and you couldn't get to the front of the line? You can't meet with God. He says, but God is a spirit. And the time is coming when those that worship Him will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Jesus came to reveal the truth of God. And, and we have been given His Spirit from the, through the new creation. We have been engrafted. We have been submerged. We have been baptized into Him. And do you understand? Because of that, because of that, we don't have to ascend a mountain to get to the throne of God. We don't have to work our way through the crowd to get to God. We we don't have to wait our 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 time in line to get to God. God is able to have a personal, intimate relationship with each one of us all the time. See, Jesus, if He would have stayed on the earth, what would have happened? Well, we see what happened. There was times He went out and met with with the crowd. There's times when He looked up in a tree and had an individual relationship with Zacchaeus, and went and had dinner at their house. But he couldn't be close to all those people. As a pastor, I can't be close to everyone. So he was close to 12. Right? If God was was physical, he couldn't be close to everyone. He couldn't be close to you. Jesus could only be close to 12. And Jesus says, it's good that I go to the Father. Why? Because God so desires to be close with you. God desires to have all his focus, all his love, all his attention just on you. And Paul understands his revelation when he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and God dwells in you. Did 
This was God's plan. His plan was not just to redeem you. His plan was to get personal with you, that you may have eternal life, that you might know God and Jesus Christ whom he had sent. What a gift. What an amazing gift that we neglect. What, what a God. What a Father. What a Abba. What a, how many things in life do you go through? Where you got to make a decision and, and you don't know what to do. And you have the one that created all things right there with you. Focused on you. How many times have you been depressed looking at your circumstances when you have the one that is the source of all joy right there with you? How many times have you felt powerless and you have the one that created is all powerful right there, completely 100% focused on you? How many times have we felt like we weren't loved? When the one who is love himself, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 357 days a year, has all of his love 100% focused on you. Can you see how Christmas is all about you? Can you, can, you, can you see that you're the reason for the season? Can you see why you can say boldly and passionately, I am the reason for the season? Say it with me. I am. Please don't wait for me. Let's try it again. I am the reason for the season. I am the reason for the season. He did it all for me. He did it just for me. He, he's focused on me. His love is laser focused on me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have, you have, Revealed yourself to us in the word that became flesh, Emmanuel. God with us. You've dwelt among us. You've showed us what you're like. You, you showed us that you're a God that's personal. You showed us that you're a God of the individual. You showed us that you're a God that loves us in our uniqueness. You showed us that you're a God that would came just for us. That you've done it all just for us. You are an amazing God. And Holy Spirit, we ask that in this coming season, in this coming year, that by faith, we would enter into the grace that's available to us to know this God. To know this love. To know this provision. To know this power. To know this understanding and destiny and and to experience fullness, to enter into eternal life. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church. For more information or to contact us, go to www.karisntc.org. And remember, you are deeply loved highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.